Okay, everybody, let's uh, let's get started. This is a a privilege for us. Uh, Jim Leach has been a leader in Iowa politics for uh, lots of years, and um, and ad much admired by uh, by many people I know, including myself. So it, I'm delighted to be able to introduce him to you. So I'm going to read some stuff here, so I don't forget anything. But uh, this is indeed a privilege. Jim Leach is director of the Institute of Politics of the John Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. Prior to his appointment at Harvard, he taught at the Woodrow Wilson School at Princeton University. Prior to that, he served 30 years as an Iowa representative in Congress where he chaired the Banking and Financial Services Committee, the Subcommittee on Asian and Pacific Affairs, and the Congressional Executive Commission on China. He holds eight honorary degrees, has received decorations from two foreign governments, and is a recipient of the Wayne Morse Integrity and in Politics Award, the Woodrow Wilson Award from Johns Hopkins, the Adlai Stevenson Award from the United Nations Association, and the Edgar Weyburn Award from the Sierra Club. He serves on the board of several public companies and three nonprofit corporations, the Century Foundation, the Kettery Foundation, and the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. He is a member of the Council on Foreign Relations and formerly served as a trustee of Princeton University. Jim, thank you very much for coming. We're looking forward to your talk. Well, thank you very much. And happy Halloween, everybody. Uh, the uh, uh, people you see walking your streets uh, look like uh, apparitions of candidates, but apparently uh, they're real in Iowa this, this year. And um, I watched the Democratic debate last night, and I'm going to give a, a nonpartisan talk, but I, I want you to know if, if you see anyone looking for a UFO, uh, they may be one of the Democratic candidates. Uh, to understand that joke, you, you'll have to have watched the debate last night. Uh, in any regard, what I want to uh, talk about is uh, a little bit of historical perspective uh, as tied to issues of the day and some of the complications in American politics, particularly as they relate to leadership. Uh, if you... Uh, think about uh, where we're going, uh, I sometimes like to suggest that there are courses that can be given of, of a one or two minute nature, and I'm going to give a dozen tonight, uh, approximately a dozen, and, and the first I call Political Science 101. Uh, American politics over the last generation has divided the country about a third Democratic, a third Republican, a third no party, and, and they're they switch back and forth. Right now, the Democratic third is clearly larger than a third, and the Republican third is, is, is a bit smaller. But if you think of just as a generality, and if any of you have taken math, you know half of a third is a sixth. So one-sixth of the country controls the Republican Party, and one-sixth the Democratic. On the other hand, uh, only about half of Americans vote for president, and so uh, that means half of a sixth is a twelfth, but about one-fourth of that number vote in primaries, so one-fourth of a twelfth is a forty-eighth. And the reason I say this is that somewhere between two and four to six percent of Americans control the Republican Party, and two to four to six percent, depending on the state, control the Democratic Party. And within the Republican Party, that's quite conservative. Within the Democratic Party, it's, it's rather liberal. And it's in American politics, it's an embarrassment that just over half of, 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 of eligible citizens vote in general elections. But it is a critical problem that such a small number vote in primaries. And primaries are where candidates are chosen and they're where platforms are established. And so if you wonder why the Democratic Party candidates are pretty liberal in their articulation at this time and why the Republican candidates are pretty conservative in their articulation, it's all because they're trying to appeal to the primary voter, uh, which is not the same as the country at large. Uh, and that means that from an Iowa perspective, 
the caucuses are not slightly important, they are extraordinarily important. We start the process and we as a state have an obligation to really begin with a thinking circumstance. Uh, and I raise this only from the perspective of, of Iowa State University because extraordinarily young people have the greatest vested interest in politics today because after all it's young people's lifetime that's going to be affected by decisions particularly those that relate to war and peace but also economics and young people ought to be overwhelming participants in the primary uh, we're going to start a, uh, in the next few weeks and we'll make some public announcements a, a major national initiative to get young people to vote in primaries uh, coming from the university I'm currently at. But I, 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 I would like to really stress this point that if all college age students vote in the Iowa caucuses, this will be the majority participants in the caucus system. And this is an opportunity for young people unrivaled, and I want to say this very carefully, literally in the history of American politics. And so I really urge you all, even though if you're tempted to be distraught about the political process, unclear of whether you're Republican or Democrat, take a little bit of a leap of faith and go to one caucus or the other with full knowledge that in the next primary, the next election, you might want to switch parties or in the general election, switch judgments. But participate because participation is the only way that the ideas and ideals of youth can be reflected. Now my second course I call Political Science 102. Everybody kind of understands that in primaries for president, the Republicans scoot to the right, Democrats scoot to the left, and then in the general, they try to come back a little bit more towards the center. Ironically, in Congress, you don't have near that same second phenomenon. Uh, and if you take the House of Representatives, out of 435 House seats, about 380 to 385 are totally safe within a party. About half of these are Republican, about half are Democrat. And what that means is that if you are elected as a nominee of, of, of your party in a safe Republican district, the chances are to have won the primary, you've scooted rather far to the right and the Democrat vice versa, but you have no incentive once elected ever to move to the center because your only challenge in a safe seat is from within your party and your only significant challenge is to someone if you're a Democrat taking you on from the left and if you're a Republican taking you on from the right. And so what happens today in today's kind of, 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 of congressional setting is the tendency is to, to elect candidates somewhat to the right of the party and to the left of the party and once nominated there's a tendency not to come back to the center. Uh, this brings me to political science 103 is that from a lawmaking perspective there's also a, a tendency to stay to the extremes in how one uh, attempts to lead one's own party and so uh, if you take a Republican, uh, there is a case, for example, in the state of Iowa that is quite large, uh, and, and I want to speak here directly to Iowa State, to, to reform somewhat the estate tax issue. Uh, otherwise, family farms are going to be subjected to uh, rather extraordinary taxation that can jeopardize family farming in our state. The same is true of small business. But there is a way of looking at this that protects the small business, the family farmer. You can raise what's called the exemption before estate taxes kick in from the current, say, six, eight hundred thousand level to three, four, five, six, maybe even ten million, and that covers all family farmers. But if you look at what the candidates are articulating, it isn't to protect the family farmer or the family small business. It's to protect the billionaire, and it's to take estate taxes off totally. But there have been some economic studies done that in the very largest estates, there's been surprising little 
taxation in the accumulation of large assets along the way and 